I returned to New Zealand with every intention of staying here. Uh, but I ran into problems very quickly with the chiropractic profession. And I realized that, you know, I didn't even have a degree. I had a diploma in physiotherapy. And doctors have degrees, and everybody in the university has degrees. And I saw the future of physiotherapy was to have a degree. So I knew I had to return to America to get a PhD. And as such, I would come back with a PhD and be the first New Zealander to have a PhD. Now, it turned out I wasn't. Um, Joan Walker became the first New Zealander. She lives in Canada, as you may well know, to have a PhD, and she's a fellow of this association, as am I. But that was the intention. However, uh, it took a bit longer to get a PhD, as you probably know, <laughs> than I originally thought. And I got divorced in America, and with children remaining, I stayed, and that became my life. But I continue to come back here, as you know. Well. Um, part of the reason I left New Zealand also was because the chiropractors were suing me and my profession could not defend me. Keith Ritson was a member or president of the Board of Physiotherapy and a good friend of my father's. And Keith Ritson was a Wellington physiotherapist. And he said to Dad, quite frankly, we can't do anything to help Stanley, young Stanley. Uh, my father had the same name as me. He said, he's on his own. Now, this is not manipulation. It's not an accepted part of our practice. We can't defend him. We don't have the funds to do it. So I struck a deal with the chiropractors. I said, I, if you drop your charges, I'll leave the country. So, so that's it. And so they agreed to it. Uh, that saves a lot of expense, but my intention was to come back in about five years uh, with a PhD and go a different route through the university and be much stronger and uh, not have to do that again. Now, however, that uh, got me to England, uh, it got me to America in 1966. And I, I heard uh, that Maitland was going to England, uh, being sponsored by the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy to teach manual therapy. And I thought, well, that's one gentleman I haven't met. Uh, what an excellent opportunity to meet him and Gregory Grieve, who was the main sponsor of um, the tour that Maitland was going to put on. I think Maitland was there for three to six months. So I got in touch with Grieve and uh, Maitland, and we agreed to meet. Now, I think what I'm about to tell you is something that's never been recorded or, or noted before, but I think it's okay to do it now because uh, I think history needs to know this. I asked those two gentlemen if, they, if I could also bring down Kaltenborn from Norway so the four of us could meet, and they didn't wish to do that. Um, I don't know exactly why, one can speculate, but whereas I'm one for bringing people together, I've always believed that... Uh, well, well, consensus can't be reached, and nor should it necessarily be reached, uh, because I think consensus can be stifling to minority views, and minority views need to be respected. It's good to get people together into forums where they can exchange their ideas. So I agreed to the fact, okay, well then, we would just be the three of us, Maitland, Grieve, and myself meeting. But I also arranged for Carltonborn to come, and I accidentally, in quotes, made a mistake on the times that we should meet. It so happens we all turned up at the same place at the same time. And uh, true to form, Carlton Bourne tended to dominate the conversations, which was part of the reason perhaps they didn't want to meet with him. He was very self-confident, very strong, very strident, and whereas Maitland is a much gentler person, a gentleman. Uh, and so is Carlton Bourne, but different style. But anyhow, from those discussions, from that, that day we had uh, with Monica Martin-Jones, and I'm trying to think who else was there, but uh, a, a woman by the name of D Dwyer. Uh, we met in London. It was agreed that we would set, uh, set up a, a committee to form an international body to bring together all of us. Now, that committee uh, I was to chair, and the other members of the committee would be Rob McKenzie of New Zealand and Hannah Torsen of Denmark. And the consultants to the committee were Freddie Cartonborn, Geoffrey Maitland and Gregory, uh, of Australia and Gregory Grieve of, of England. And we had uh, three years to bring this about um, uh, to, to sort of get, get going. So after we met in London um, and set up this committee, we went to um, Amsterdam in 1970 uh, for the um, WCPT meeting. 1970, and at a meeting of many different nations, not now just uh, this committee group, um, it was agreed to back this committee 
to bring about IFOMP, the International Federation of Orthopedic Manipulative Therapy, in Montreal uh, in 1974. That would be this, the WCPT was meeting there. So I ran that. I got hold of every country and asked for the interested, asked them to elect, uh, nominate someone from each country to speak for manual therapy. And so when we got to Montreal, there were 13 countries. I'd prepared a constitution which they'd all, all the representative received, and now in one day we tried to bring a whole society together. And uh, I was very familiar with Robert's Rules of Order, which I think are pretty traditional, but they're not traditional in Europe or Norway. And so it was a very difficult meeting to run to get people to agree. And so at about a third of the way through the meeting, I said, we will never get through today's work if you don't give me authority as chairman to draw motions from what I'm hearing and move on. And then at the end of the day, you get to vote on the whole thing if you like it. And that worked because there were so many things you could bicker about for hours, like three directors or four directors. <laughs> you, know, you hear the sentiment, I'd make a motion, they'd approve it, we'd move on. And then they got a chance at the end of the day. Well, they're also relieved at the end of the day to know that we actually had a constitution that they can now could vote on and we could begin our operations. Or they could start squabbling over it and we never have it. They voted on it, and so uh, in 1974, IFOMP was founded, and it was founded for two distinct purposes. I was one of the people who felt that it should be founded principally for a forum for the exchange of ideas. Uh, Maitland and Kaltenborn felt it should be founded principally for the establishment of standards internationally. And I could see the infighting that would occur with standards, and I opposed that, because I, I thought that would tear the society the organization apart in its founding years. Anyhow, that passed. Both things passed. It would be a forum for the exchange of ideas and it would set standards for membership. And I'm very pleased to say I was wrong on the standards because setting up standards gave countries something to aim for and it's worked. Uh, various people from Grendel and Joel, I think I was one of the most recent chairs of the standard committee before that, David Lamb of Canada, Gwen Joel of Australia, they worked very hard at those jobs and uh, did a fine job. So the standards of IFOMP have become something to aspire to, and still we are a great forum to meet, so everyone's interest will met. I was the um, founding chairman. I chaired that session, and then I was not elected to the board. I didn't run for a position. In fact, it was a good idea for me not to run for a position. People had enough of me over the previous four years. But I became the second president and the third president, and then I was on the past presidency for another eight years, so 16 years on the executive of IFOMP. And it's grown from a small organization to a pretty powerful one now, and very influential, and it's part of the World Confederation. And um, I'm very pleased with everything that's happened there.